So welcome everybody. Um, we are very lucky to have Professor Van P. Carey as our keynote uh, speaker for this session. I would like to give a brief introduction to our distinguished speaker before his talk. Professor Carey is a professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department and holds the A. Richard Newton Chair in Engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. He is widely recognized for his research in the areas of micro and nanoscale thermophysics, interfacial phenomena, and transport and liquid vapor phase change processes. His research interests also include development of new methods for computational modeling and simulation of energy conversion and transport processes. Professor Carey's research has covered a wide variety of application areas, including solar thermal power systems, building and vehicle air conditioning, phase change thermal energy storage, Rankine cycle power for manned space missions, heat pipes for aerospace applications, high heat flux cooling of electronics, energy efficiency of information processing systems, and microgravity boiling. His recent research has focused on the physics of water vaporization processes on surfaces with nanoporous coatings, uh, adaptive thermal energy storage, and the use of machine learning tools in phase change heat transfer research. Professor Carey is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Engineers ASME, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he has also served as the chair of the heat transfer division of ASME. He has received the James Harry Potter Gold Medal in 2004 for his eminent achievement in thermodynamics and the Heat Transfer Memorial Award in the science category from the ASME in 2007. He is also a three-time recipient of the Hewlett Packard Research Innovation Award for his research on electronics thermal management and energy efficiency in 2008, 2009 and 2010. And he also received the 2014 Thermophysics Award from the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIWA. Today's talk by Professor Carey will be on machine learning as a tool to explore and model the thermophysics of heat transfer with phase change. Please join, in, join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker. Over to you, Professor Carey. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me... Uh, are you seeing my screen okay? Uh, not as yet. Ah, okay, let me... Um... I'm sorry, I thought I had things set up here and I uh, didn't quite get the shared setting um, put into place here. Okay. Yeah, it's up now, sir. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for, for that very gracious introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as, as indicated in the title here, I'm uh, talking today about uh, machine learning as a tool. Um, I, I think that uh, everybody that's been working in any area of technology over the past five years has uh, realized that uh, machine learning uh, capabilities are beginning to influence a wide variety of different types of application areas. The um, area of machine learning is, is quite large, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, there are a variety of different approaches to machine learning and also uh, different uh, ways that uh, they can be adapted to different types of applications. Um, in the past five years in particular, um, we've been tracking a rapid increase in the interest in using these types of tools for enhancing energy technology research and development. And as kind of a subset of that, there's been a lot of interest both on our part and other investigators in the field in using these type of tools to explore phase change processes and how they play a role in, uh, in different types of technologies. Um, you're probably aware of some of the names at the least of, of different types of, of uh, machine learning tools, neural networks, genetic algorithms, uh, convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and Q-learning, um, uh, reinforcement learning uh, type approaches. Um, we've used a number of these, and uh, because of the time limitation here today, I'm going to uh, focus uh, specifically on neural networks and genetic algorithms, um, which uh, I think have become among the more popular approaches to this this uh, sort of technology. Obviously, uh, a key question here is why use these types of tools for phase change process analysis and modeling? Well, uh, if you take a look at, at phase change processes and the thermophysics associated with it, 
uh, what you typically find are a collection of characteristics that make modeling and, and assessment of, of data um, prediction uh, challenging for these types of applications. And it's a consequence of several different characteristics that are common in these types of processes. Uh, one is that the processes are often nonlinear. Um, the phase change processes are often subject to instabilities, and the instabilities can lead to regime and performance changes. In the two-phase flow that's depicted to the right here, um, you can see that there's a multitude of flow regimes that the, the flow passes through. And what you get as an output from that type of system is a very complicated function of, of what goes on in, in terms of the operating conditions. Um, there are typically at least two phases present when you have these types of processes going on. And as a result, there's an increase in the number of relevant physical properties, both for a liquid phase and a solid phase or a liquid phase and a vapor phase. Um, that adds to the complexity of the system. There's also interfacial phenomena. So interfacial tension and wetting characteristics are typically uh, factors that uh, enter in. And in addition, um, there's multiple physical effects that come into play due to the fact that uh, the system is forced to conform to thermodynamic requirements, transport requirements, and different types of interfacial phenomena, uh, boundary conditions at the interface. Uh, in addition, we typically have systems in which we may have a wide range of operating conditions for the system. And that means that you want a model that can function accurately over broad ranges of the parameters that you're providing. So the net result of all this is that uh, you have a system in which if you're going to do modeling, complex multivariate modeling capability is something that you absolutely want to have. And uh, machine learning models, particularly neural networks and genetic algorithms have capabilities of this type and, and therefore are attractive options for, for this type of analysis. Uh, the typical scenario we're interested in is one in which we have a, a data set, and what we want to do is produce uh, a model that can predict the performance characteristics that are represented in the data. The data can typically come from one of two places, uh, directly from experiments, uh, or they can come from some type of computational simulation. And for phase change processes, um, there are a variety of different simulation tools that uh, researchers use, including our group. Um, that typically can be uh, continuum CFD type computations, molecular dynamic simulations, uh, particle simulation models, and also lattice Boltzmann methods. Um, a data set then using one of these types of approaches can be uh, generated by running the simulation multiple times and collecting data over a wide range of input conditions. Once you have the data set, then typically uh, you, if you're going to use some sort of machine learning tool, you're, you're going to fo be following a workflow that looks something like the diagram here on the right hand side. Um, the data that's been collected is going to go through uh, some initial operations to prep it for input to the type of machine learning uh, tool you're going to work with. The um, type of machine learning tool that you're um, going to use is something that typically can be selected from a collection of different options. And then once you have that specified, typically you're ready then to move into a phase where you're doing the actual training operation of the model and then also doing validation to assess how good the model is. Uh, once you have done that process to a point where you're satisfied with the performance, then you have as an outcome from all of this, a model which you can use to predict um, output uh, conditions for the process in whatever application you're interested in for optimization or for simply looking at the parameter trends to try to understand the physics. Um, one thing to kind of note here is that, you know, these types of models in their purest forms typically are models that contain no physics. They're, they're basically making predictions based on the mathematical trends in the data. Um, so they, they lack um, the sort of underpinning or the framework that comes with 
uh, the type of physical modeling that many of us in the heat transfer community are, are used to doing. Uh, I'm going to talk, as I mentioned, about um, two types of modeling. Again, because of time limitations, I can't get into this too deeply, but there's a few comments to make about um, how these work and how the, the characteristics relate to what we're typically trying to do. Um, artificial neural networks um, are a very popular approach to developing uh, data-based models. Uh, typically what you're doing is using a collection of neuron models and, and the neurons are designed so that they mimic uh, the behavior of organic neurons in organisms. Uh, typically what you're doing is creating a neural network by stacking multiple layers of the neurons into, into a network structure. Uh, typically these have one input layer, one output layer, and uh, one or more layers of neurons between uh, those two limits. And of course you have a lot of flexibility in determining what the structure looks like, how many layers, how many neurons in each one, and, and even the capabilities of the neurons are things that you can uh, vary in these types of simulations and, and modeling uh, activities. A um, couple of comments on relevant features of, of these types of models. When you train uh, a network like this, what you're doing is determining the set of weights and bias parameters in the model that provide a best overall fit to the data set. Uh, typically, the number of parameters that are adjustable on these models is quite large. And that has a good aspect and, and maybe a not so good aspect. The good aspect is that that gives it a tremendous capability to learn and model complex features of the data from the system. On the other hand, um, if you make your system too complex, uh, the a number of adjustable parameters can become so large that the system can actually begin fitting the noise in the data rather than actual physical trends that you're interested in. So the overfitting issue is one that uh, practitioners pay a lot of attention to. Also, uh, another thing worth noting is the fact that um, if you look at the, the way that the neuron operates, it, it takes the inputs, it multiplies each one by its by, uh, by its weight uh, parameter, and then adds them up and adds a bias uh, parameter to that. Um, that comes out of the neuron and then goes into the activation function. And the activation function is typically a, a nonlinear function. Everything uh, prior to that in the calculation is linear, but the activation function is nonlinear. And that's significant because it's the activation function which is actually providing the nonlinear capability of the model. So there are different activation functions you can use and picking one that, that is best suited for your application is something that uh, typically practitioners have to pay attention to. Final comment here is that when you train a, a network like this and, and you generate a model that you can use for predictive purposes, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, what you get is a code which you can put arbitrary inputs into and you can get predictions of output. Uh, you don't get a mathematical function that lets you, you know, visually see what the algebraic form looks like. It's to a certain extent kind of a black box in which you can put information in and you get information out. So uh, that has to be uh, a form that's acceptable for whatever it is that, that you want to do for your application. An alternate approach would be to use a genetic algorithm, and a genetic algorithm contrasts somewhat with uh, neural networks because um, uh, in the form we usually use anyways, um, what we typically do is we, we use physical uh, reasoning theory, um, data trends to uh, motivate uh, postulating a particular functional form for the uh, mathematical function that relates the parameters and the out and the uh, output. Um, so, for example, if you had a uh, functional form that um, that looked something like this equation up here on the right hand side of the slide, um, what you can see is that uh, we've got different parameters here, and we've got a multiplying constant, and we've got um, well, that should be an n two. There's a little typo there. Um, 
n3 and 4 and these are all adjustable constants and the idea in this activity would be to try to find values of those constants that would best fit the data and then this equation would become a predictor of the performance of the system given an arbitrary set of inputs. Um, genetic algorithms can do that by basically mimicking natural selection. And uh, what's typically done is to establish an initial population uh, of organisms, if you will. And each organism is, is basically got a collection of constants. These would be the genes for the, the organism, if you will. And um, we have a collection of those. So these are all sort of candidate solutions. And what we're trying to find is the candidate solution or the collection of candidate solutions that uh, best fit the data. So this type of algorithm goes through a process in which it basically um, determines a, a fitness parameter for each one of these uh, organisms. And typically the way it can do that is to take this equation, uh, insert the uh, gene values that are associated with it, calculate an output, and then compare that. Uh, and, and you do this for a set of inputs that correspond to one of the data that you have. And then you compare the output to the uh, heat flux value or the, the Q double prime value that's your output parameter in the data set. And what you do is you look at how much error there is in that. Um, small error is high fitness. And of course, the converse is, is true. And uh, it, um, that gives us a fitness assessment for each one of the uh, organisms in the, uh, the set that we have, this ensemble. The, um, once this calculation has been done for all the organisms, then what you do is you decide um, what fitness level is going to be a threshold below which the organism will not be um, carried forward into the next generation. They will be eliminated from the population. Uh, the remaining organisms then are allowed to uh, basically produce offspring, and they do that by randomly contributing uh, one of their genes uh, in each category to the, um, uh, the offspring organism. Uh, those new offspring are added to the population, and this process continues repeating through generations. And what you typically find is that you uh, progressively generate a population which has um, values of these constants, these gene constants in narrow ranges, and they converge into a population which has a very um, high fitness and therefore a very small accurate inaccuracy compared to the data. So this is basically the, the methodology in general terms. Um, there are some key elements in using this, this type of algorithm that uh, have to be kind of a central focus. One is kind of framing the problem. Um, and, and that of course is, is focused around what you choose for this postulated relation that you think is um, uh, appropriate for this particular system. Uh, also the definition of the fitness function or the error, if you wanna think of it that way, um, is also uh, something that, that should be given careful consideration because that will dictate oftentimes how fast the convergence will be and, and how uh, tightly uh, it will converge. Uh, also, it's kind of noteworthy that this particular type of algorithm is not what's referred to as a gradient descent method. Um, gradient descent methods are, are very common uh, and, and there's lots of variations of them. Uh, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to find a minimum in the error or a maximum in the fitness. And so you, you follow gradients on a hypersurface to try to find those extrema. Uh, if you have a surface that has multiple um, minima or maxima, you may find that it's a little tricky to get it to converge. Um, genetic algorithms, if they're structured correctly, can actually uh, converge a little bit more quickly uh, and, and be a little more stable in terms of their behavior. There's another element associated with both genetic algorithms and with uh, other types of machine learning tools uh, that you can see by considering a simple example. So what I'd like to do is, is sort of turn your attention 
Oop, sorry. Turn your attention to this example. Um, the example is a problem that I'm sure if, if you have anything to do with heat transfer, you, you heard of before, it's just film condensation on a vertical cold isothermal surface. There's a classic integral solution for this. There's uh, boundary layer similarity solutions for it. So it's a well-known problem. And uh, there's no reason you would want to apply these types of tools to this problem. But if we just take a look at what it takes to organize a, um, a machine learning analysis for this, it actually illustrates a couple of important points. So that's kind of why I'm drawing your attention to it here. Um, if you consider the physics of this problem, um, what you conclude is that the heat transfer rate associated with this condensing process is a function of, of a collection of variables. And the variables include the geometry of the surface, the driving temperature difference between the interface uh, saturation temperature and the cold surface temperature, and a collection of thermophysical properties, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Point though is that if you think about this, that implies that the heat transfer rate in, in a general sense would be a function of nine different parameters, it would be a function of these nine different parameters. Now, that turns out to be a fairly complicated uh, problem if you're, if you're trying to um, construct a solution where you're going to iterate to try to uh, fit a surface in a hyperspace because you're, you're talking about many, many dimensions of parameters and trying to get a fit of a hypersurface to a collection of points in this nine dimensional space. You can in fact uh, actually simplify the process tremendously if you bring some of the physics into the picture. And in this particular case, the physics indicates that um, the interrelationship among heat transfer and the rest of the parameters can be represented in terms of four dimensionless groups. And you can conclude this either by putting together one of the model schemes for, for this type of process, or you can use um, the um, dimensional analysis type tools that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with from, from basic engineering science. In this particular case, you end up with the four uh, dimensionless groups that are down here at the lower portion of this page. Um, there's kind of a condensation Grashof number parameter here, a Prandtl number, a Jakob number, and a Nussle number. And so the net conclusion from all this is that we would expect in this space, if we transformed all the data into this space, uh, we basically would be able to express the interrelationship as Nussle number being a function of the other three parameters. What this suggests, of course, is that if you're going to do the machine learning analysis of this, you could benefit tremendously by taking the nine-dimensional data, raw data and converting it into dimensionless parameters. So you go essentially from uh, a function of nine variables to a function of three variables, and that becomes much more manageable uh, computationally. So by bringing in this physical understanding of the problem, being able to um, introduce this transformation to produce dimensionless variables, you end up with a problem that's much easier to work with. Now, this is a very simple problem. Uh, and you can encounter and phase change problems that have many more than nine parameters associated with them. If you go to the dimensionless form there, you may not get all the way down to three, but you may substantially reduce the order of the problem. So it's, it's a tremendously positive thing to do to be able to implement this type of approach. Uh, and, and basically then what we're talking about is uh, combining a physics framing of the problem plus uh, a, an appropriate machine learning tool to, to create the model. Oops, sorry, jump backwards there. Uh, one other thing I'll just mention here is that uh, this approach is, is highly scalable which means that uh, you can do it for relatively simple problems like the one we just considered, but you can also do it for systems which have many more um, variables associated with them. And, and so it's, it's a process that, that you can use as part of a general toolkit for doing these types of analyses. 
Okay. Um, just kind of stepping back and looking at the bigger picture then, the, um, this kind of leaves us with three options. Uh, you can do physical modeling for a particular phase change heat and mass transfer problem. You can do a purely machine learning model development in which you treat the data just as um, uh, numbers and, and you look for the interrelationship among the numbers. And then finally, um, the third option here is to uh, bring in this physics inspired framing, which can uh, allow you to um, simplify things and, and make the, the process more efficient. So the, the objective here then is to kind of point out that um, doing this type of, of hybrid approach in many ways, it, it brings about, you know, bringing into the picture the best of both processes and, and being able to attack problems that uh, are, are very challenging. Uh, I just I want to talk then just to kind of wrap things up about a couple of um, examples. Um, this is uh, sort of one sort of first example, and I wanted to point this out because um, this is actually um, sort of a schematic for a thermal uh, solar power system in Spain. Um, they have a central receiving uh, tower, which has a uh, boiler uh, element in it. So it feeds water into it at 40 bar and it flows upward and, and boils in this, in this vertical riser tube. Um, in this particular case, uh, you can use machine learning uh, to analyze what's going on here. Um, I think you can uh, well imagine that one of your objectives in running this system would be to try to control it in a way that would maintain the integrity of the components. So if you're operating at a given set of conditions, uh, typically uh, you'd like to know what the exit quality is coming out, which is indicative of how much steam you've produced, and then also what the maximum wall temperature is, because you don't want the wall temperature to get too hot. So um, if you put in the operating conditions and you constructed a full model of the two-phase flow and the boiling process and the riser tube, or you actually did an experiment with the, the system itself, you could determine what those two parameters were at the output. So you can think of those two parameters as being functions of all the operating conditions. In general though, what you're really interested in in a situation like this is being able to do the inverse calculation. Because what you'd like to know is, if I have a given set of operating conditions, what should I set the mass flow rate to in the, in the tube in order to get the exit quality and maximum tube wall temperature that I want. And so that's kind of an inverse calculation. And what you can do with, for example, a neural network is collect data either from uh, two-phase flow simulations or from uh, actual testing of the system and generate a database which gives you optimal mass flow rate of water as a function of inlet parameters. And then once you uh, train your network for that, you can use that so that under any set of conditions, you can use that, that code to basically predict where you should set your flow rate to avoid having too high a wall temperature and to get the exit quality that you want. So this is actually a different type of application for a phase change system in which uh, we're actually aiming to do sort of adaptive control, to use the, the neural network uh, type modeling to provide the basis for a, an adaptive control scheme. So that's really a different type of, of strategy compared to just being able to predict uh, performance. The second um, example I just wanted to talk to, to, talk to you about was um, connected to some work, some research um, that, that we did uh, a few years back, and then we kind of revisited recently. Um, one of my earlier graduate students it, it basically participated in uh, parabolic flight reduced gravity experiments. Um, there was a, a, a jet, a NASA jet here that used to fly out of uh, Cleveland's airport, and, and he went on the jet and actually ran these experiments. But the basic point is that uh, if you go to reduce gravity, the problem with boiling processes is that gravity is no longer drawing liquid back to the surface. It's um, 
uh, allowing the vapor to kind of hang around. And that tends to make the surface blanket with very vapor and you get a very early transition to critical heat flux. Uh, we got interested in, in doing these types of experiments uh, under kind of unusual circumstances. We actually were doing experiments in mixtures of water and 2-propanol. A 2-propanol is an alcohol that's a surface active agent, and it concentrates at the interface in, in these types of systems. So you can put a very tiny amount in, and it will uh, reduce the surface tension at the interface. And furthermore, it produces a Marangoni effect. And, and basically what happens, if you take a look at this diagram that's in the uh, middle of the screen here, uh, along the interface of, of bubbles that are forming and growing at the surface, down here near the contact line where the vaporization is strongest, the alcohol preferentially evaporates. And so its concentration is very low and the surface tension is high. Uh, when you move away from that location out into towards the bulk here, this region, because there's no vaporization going on here, the uh, concentration of alcohol is higher, and so the surface tension is lower. So we have low surface tension uh, away from the surface and high surface tension near the surface, and that tends to pull liquid along the interface towards the contact line. So this type of system has a second restorative force that actually draws liquid towards the surface. And what we were interested in exploring was what the interplay was between gravity, which draws liquid back under normal gravity conditions, but is very weakened under the um, reduced gravity conditions, and this type of Marangoni effect. So we basically did a bunch of experiments and took data created pool boiling curves, basically, nucleate boiling curves for a variety of conditions at different water pressures, uh, at different um, uh, mole fraction of the alcohol in the bulk, and also under conditions where we had different shifts in the um, surface tension between the near wall condition and the far wall condition. And then also, of course, different um, changes in gravitational acceleration. Actually, the way these aircraft worked was that they would climb, and while they were climbing, they were actually pulling two Gs. So you'd get two Gs while it was climbing, and you would get micro G as it came down. And of course, we could also do 1G experiments uh, in our laboratory. So we got data for a whole host of um, different conditions. Now, when we began to realize what we could do with um, the machine learning tools, we recognized that we might have an opportunity to explore what the effects of some of these uh, uh, special parameters were. And to do that, what we did was we kind of took a look at um, conventional pool boiling correlations. This is the well-known Rosenau correlation for, for pool boiling. And uh, what you can see here is that there are specific dimensionless groups that appear in this. And so what we proposed to do we said, well, what we want to do is we want to take our data and we want to transform it into a dimensionless uh, condition. Uh, we also want to include dimensionless groups associated with changes in gravity and changes in the uh, sort of Marangoni surface tension effect. So we added this gamma parameter, which is associated with that, and the ratio of the actual gravitational acceleration to Earth normal. And based on that, and in our sort of examination of the trends, we, we came up with a hypothesis for what this functional form, what, what the Rosenau correlation would have to be modified to in order to allow for these parameters to be accounted for. And then we asked the question, well, can we create a um, uh, genetic algorithm which can figure out what these constants are? And in fact, we did that and it actually worked out amazingly well. Um, we, we took our data and we were able to um, start the genetic algorithm code off with uh, basically um, guesses that were all sort of close to one and, and let just evolve over time. And we also started with numbers that were close to zero and they, they all basically converged to values of these constants, which were uh, very close to each other. And uh, this plot basically shows a a comparison of the, uh, the predicted um, heat flux with these constants and the corresponding experimental value. And you can see that they 
actually agree uh, quite well. Uh, when you put these constants into the functional equation, you get an equation that looks like this. And so what we get from all this is uh, a, an equation, which is basically a modified form of the Rosenau boiling correlation, which includes these additional effects. And so we've been able to take this and use it as a tool, as a way of, of exploring this phenomena and understanding the, how the mechanisms interact a little bit. Um, I'll just show you a little bit more of the results from this. Um, we actually took the same data and tried using some other types of machine learning um, methodologies. We, we also used a neural network to try to model it, and, and we added the comparison of its predictions versus data, and it actually agreed quite well. Um, we also uh, used a downhill uh, simplex algorithm, and uh, the genetic algorithm and the simplex algorithm give, basically give us um, uh, mathematical forms for the equations. The neural network does not. Uh, but all three basically are very competent uh, ways of uh, predicting the performance for these types of systems. And in addition, you know, we can take this type of um, relation and kind of represent it graphically. This is basically a plot which shows th these are kind of the parameters that are in the, the basic uh, Rosenau um, correlation. And these are the other two parameters which cause it to deviate from what the Earth normal and no Marangoni effect uh, performance characteristics are. So we get a very nice picture of, of kind of what the theoretical implications are for um, these added effects on the boiling process. Okay, well, to wrap things up then, let me just um, uh, conclude by sort of summarizing some of the key ideas that, that I've uh, been talking about here. Um, first of all, you know, our conclusion, and I think the conclusion of many others working in this field, is that uh, these types of tools can enhance um, different types of research and certainly phase change process R&D in at least two ways. One is uh, by providing an alternate approach to understanding the physics, uh, and, and we certainly saw that in the reduced gravity um, boiling data uh, analysis we did. Um, it also can be used to develop adaptive technologies in which allow the um, uh, system to adapt to different conditions, even in the face of having fairly complicated uh, phase change process behavior. Um, I talked about that in connection with the solar thermal um, uh, central receiver boiler situation. And, and of course, there are other types of applications in which this might be applicable too. Um, I also want to point out that um, this, this can be a situation in which, you know, these types of tools can be constantly updating the modeling, even as the, the model is being used in the field to do active controlling. It can be monitoring how it reacts, what the performance of the system is, and it can actually be updating its capabilities to, to do a better job of predicting. The um, other aspect of this that I sort of focused on was the fact that uh, strategically and synergistically combining physics modeling and understanding with the, the machine learning tools can be a very effective way of getting kind of the benefits of both types of approaches. Um, and of course, this can be um, implemented in terms of uh, using it to guide definition of, of dimensionless parameters to do a transformation of the data, and also to uh, uh, basically um, guide you in terms of how you might um, hypothesize a governing equation or a predictive equation for the particular system of interest. The um, final thing I'll just say about this is that the physics-inspired type approach to this, I think, is, is something that holds tremendous opportunity for all of us in the research community to, to leverage these types of capabilities and to use them to improve the research that we're engaged in. And just finally, I'll, I'll mention as a final comment here is that uh, I, I've mentioned only sort of two um, related applications here in the discussion, but we've actually used these types of approaches in, in a whole collection of different applications, including uh, pool boiling with nanoporous coatings, droplet evaporations on, on nanoporous coatings, uh, phase change thermal storage, 
and also spray cooling type applications. So we really see a tremendous uh, level of opportunity uh, for, for new and innovative things to do with these. So with that, I'll quit and I'll be glad to take any questions if there are any. Hope I didn't uh, run things too long here. No, 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 I think it's okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Kari. Uh, there is time for a couple of questions in case uh, anybody has a question. Sajid, will we get questions from other places or only on? Uh, I mean, can you get questions from YouTube or something? Sir, we'll get questions from the conference portal. Okay. Okay. While we are uh, waiting, sir, I have a question. If, if that's sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. So, um, so you talked about basically the physics inspired approach for uh, incorporating our knowledge of physics into thermophysics uh, models. So currently the examples you showed were we, we either had like some non-dimensionalization insights or maybe in sort of the pool boiling example, you had some expression, some basic expression, and then we are trying to work out the parameters and ML tries to work that out. There is now an alternate approach. I'll uh, be familiar with it for the last couple of years, which is physics informed uh, neural networks where they are actually incorporating the differential equation directly into this. H how mm -hmm. much of a role do you think uh, it will play in the kind of problems that you are looking at, especially with complex physics? I think with simpler problems, it's okay, but with complex physics sort of like boiling. Uh, do you see it playing much of a role in the future? Uh, what's your opinion? Uh, now, uh, just to understand your question, um, when, you, when you say it playing a role, are you talking about this, this alternate approach with the physics? Uh, informed, including the differential yeah. equations within the regression process, essentially. Uh, yeah, no, I think that uh, there is potential for um, those types of, of uh, interconnections between these different approaches. Um, the, you know, clearly, um, you know, we have these different types of physical simulations, which can be CFD type simulations and um, molecular dynamic simulations, lattice Boltzmann and so forth. Um, it seems to me quite feasible that, you know, you could consider putting together kind of a hyper model that could, mm -hmm. you know, incorporate both a machine learning component and, you know, maybe a, um, uh, like a lattice Boltzmann or, or a CFD that could be interacting, you know, actually during a, a simulation calculation. Right. Um, so I, I think there's, there's some exciting ideas that, you know, could potentially uh, open, some interesting new doors if, if we can can get them uh, on track. Right, right, right. Um, are there other questions um, for people attending the talk? Yes, sir, there is a question. Uh, it has come. Okay, let me just check. Um, so, Professor Carey, I'll just read this question. It's come on chat. Um, okay. For complicated problems such as airplane, uh, the aircraft problem that you mentioned, how do you design experiments? Uh, how do you decide how many data points to collect? Uh, as per my understanding, uh, to use artificial neural networks, we need a very large data set. So that's that's the question that has come. Well, th that's a very insightful question. Um, I didn't talk about um, size of data sets much at all in the talk, but it is absolutely true that, you know, for these methods, um, more is better. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, we, we've had almost a surprising level of success with modest size data sets. And um, uh, I think you, you have to um, be careful about how you design the, the methodology and, and because you you want to avoid a situation, you know, with, with the neural networks, for example, I mean, you can make the network so big that you have, you know, literally hundreds or thousands of constants to adjust. And if you've only got 500 data points, you know, you're, you're not really, um, you don't really have the right balance there. So um, I think you, you have to um, be a little bit aware of, of how to judiciously uh, 
set up the scope of, of your, your model versus the scope of your data. Um, so I think our experience has been that certainly um, working with larger data sets is, is definitely better. You'll get richer information and your, your fit will be uh, something that's you know, truly representative of what's going on physically. Um, but on the other hand, you can take, you know, relatively smaller sets and also do explorations. And, and we've had some fairly good um, results with even with smaller sets. Any further questions? Um, if not, please uh, uh, join me in thanking Professor uh, Carey for a very, very insightful talk on how machine learning can be useful in problems with phase change. Thank you, sir. Thank you so well, much. Thanks to you. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it and I uh, hope you, uh, everything goes well at the conference. Thank you very much. Bye now.